Now, this is an interview with Grave Huffer on Sunday, March 27th, 2022 by Nick Brickell. Now, I last spoke to you in July 2020. Can you update me on what's been going on with Grave Huffer? Yeah, um, since then, um, I remember our last interview and it was right before we announced the release of the title of our album, Necro Eclosion. And so that was re released in January of uh, 2021 on Black Duma Records. And we released that on vinyl and CD and digital. And um, that was a pretty big moment for us. Um, we had a lot of special guests on the record, including Chewy from Voivod and Coran Murphy, who was in Nevermore and Annihilator. And uh, so that, that was you know, really special. And then um, around May of last year, we started playing shows again. Um, we had to cancel quite a few shows last, or what was it, 2020? <laughs> I'm getting, it's been, it seems like it hadn't been that long, but I guess it's been almost a couple of years now due to the pandemic. And so um, we started playing some shows again and we played, gosh, I would say, a good 20 shows or, or more. Uh, we, I mean, starting from just playing in Missouri, and then we, we ventured out into the southern part of the country. We did Florida and Alabama and Georgia. Um, you know, we even did like the Midwest, like Tennessee and Ohio. And, uh, we even played Nebraska. And so, yeah, we, we, we just tried to play a lot of shows because it, it had been over a year since we, we, we played some shows. So, so that was kind of our main focus after getting the record out was um, was playing shows and you know promoting the record like a, a good working band uh, should do. So so yeah, that was um, that was pretty much it. Was just re releasing Necro Eclosion and then and then playing shows and um, can't really think of anything else um, other than we are working on our new record. But um, we could always talk about that. I could always talk about that in another question. Okay, sure. Now, you released a split with Souls of Hades mm -hmm. a bit after our last interview two years ago. Can you speak about the song yeah. Shut Up mm -hmm. and Skate as well as Your Fault? Yeah, um, those were songs that were on our album, Your, uh, Your Fault. Um, the Your Fault album was kind of a weird, <laughs> kind of a weird deal. That was like 2016, 2017 when that was originally released. And it was supposed to be with one label. Well, that label like disintegrated. And then we had another label that put it out that we just weren't real happy with how that was handled. And that's why we went to Black Doomba. Um, but we had had the song Your Fault. It was exclusive to the vinyl release of it. And we didn't have it available anywhere else. And so no slip records. Um, they did a, um, <clears throat> a two song EP with us. Demon Face, Stalingrad's Cross. And this was kind of why, why we were waiting to find a permanent home in Black Doomba. Uh, no Slip Records was one of the labels that um, kind of gave us a, a chance to put something out there and until we could get, you know, a, a, something to release a full length. So anyway, uh, No Slip did the split with Souls of Hades. They're a band from New Zealand, which was really cool they're pretty different from us but it still made sense because they're still kind of that dirty hard heavy style that we have uh shut up and skate like i said it's, it's on the your fault record your fault the song is from the vinyl edition of your fault it's not on the cd it was a vinyl exclusive bonus track and um kind of a weird story behind that but Basically, it was recorded in a separate session from the rest of the record. And so it kind of has a little different sound. And um, it was actually the last song recorded with our original drummer, Larry Deerdorf. And um, we just thought it would be cool to put it out on its own since it was only available on the Your Fault vinyl release. And as far as Shut Up and Skate, that was just um, like one of our more popular songs from the Your Fault record. And we just thought it made sense to uh, put that on the, the split with Souls of Hades. Um, but yeah, the Your Fault song actually features uh, Carlo Regattas, who used to be in the band Carcass. And uh, he plays the solo on that. So we thought it'd be cool to, um, you know, have that attached to 
the split as well. So, you know, we just thought it made sense. Now, listening to the Necro Explosion album, or the Necro Eclosion album, I can see you really mm. had a lot to say about different historical figures. Was there a theme to the songs or did you yeah. focus on people whose life stories intrigued you? Yeah, I think it's the latter. Um, I don't, it just, it, it happened naturally. We didn't really set out to say this album is going to be about historical figures or anything like that, or, you know, like intriguing figures or whatever. It just seemed to be that that's how that album panned out. Because uh, um, there, there's a couple songs that aren't necessarily about particular people. Um, there's a couple of songs that are more about events and things like that. And we, have, we even have a couple of songs that are more about, you know, us and what we do, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to like the song Stingray, for instance, um, our bass player wrote that just, I mean, it's just kind of like a throwback to the eighties, like BMX biking scene and um, just paying a, a tribute to that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny how that all worked out with the, the songs being about, like you say, the intriguing personalities or people in, throughout history. And uh, we just wanted it to be an interesting album and um, subject matter wise, as well as musically, of course. But, but yeah, as, a, as far as it being about, you know, characters or whatever, yeah, that, that was kind of weird how that um, just worked out that way. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't really like take we can't really take credit for making it a big grand concept or anything. It's just kind of the way it, it panned out. Now, what three <clears> songs <throat> satisfied you the most as a historian? Hmm. Well, um, Ghost Dance, which is about the Wounded Knee Massacre. That one's probably the one I'm most proud of as far as like the subject matter and the lyrics that were written, which Travis, he, that was his first, this is his first record, our, our singer, Travis, because we had had a singer, James Heiser, who had been with us since 08. And then he, he left right as we were starting to record this record, Necro Eclosion. And then we got Travis, which funnily enough is one of James's best friends. They went to school together and stuff, kind of a funny, odd coincidence, but that's how it worked out. But, um, so yeah, the ghost dance thing, I would say that's definitely one of the ones that I, I'm proud of that one. A Custom of the Sea, that's about um, cannibalism at sea. That they, they called it the Custom of the Sea because it wasn't, it wasn't illegal, but it wasn't legal per se to cannibalize people if you ran out of rations at sea. They would. It was basically not swept under the rug, but it just it wasn't it wasn't illegal per se to <laughs> eat people. The like if somebody was like um, dis- had a disease or if they were sick or maybe they're on their deathbed and like hey we're out of food we're you know they just they ate the person and it was called the quote custom of the sea and I thought that was a really interesting one. Um, and hmm, Mad Wolf, which is the Lone Wolf and Cub song, that one's our drummer at the time, Jay. He actually wrote the lyrics and sang that one. Um, that and it's funny. Our bass player was the one that actually like wanted to write the song about that particular subject, <laughs> but then uh, Jay, our drummer at the time, um, since we were breaking in Travis, we kind of all pitched in on vocals and writing lyrics and so it was a very collaborative effort and i think that's that may be what um that may be what led to the writing about you know incidents or people throughout history or intriguing people um i mean it just i guess that's kind of what was relatable to us at the time it's funny i've, I've never really thought of that so um so yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I would have to say Ghost Dance, Custom of the Sea, and Mad Wolf would, would be my three that I'm really proud of. Now, adding on that, um, the first single was Ghost Dance. This was like a ceremony added into many uh-huh. 
Native American tribes at the end of the 19th century. Where do you learn about the history of this? And yeah. was there a particular tribe's take on it that intrigued you the most? Um, well, we basically were, were um, singing about a particular incident that the ghost dance was used in, and that was the Wounded Knee Massacre that was, um, it was, it was kind of like where the Keystone Pipeline's running through now. And, um, <clears throat> pardon me. And so that, that was something that, um, I can't remember where we stumbled upon that, but, um, I, it may have been something that we saw on the internet or, or something like that, that we just thought it was a cool, cool subject. And, um, it just, it really turned into this kind of big, big thing. So, um, Travis, that was like the, I think it was the second set of lyrics, like I said, that he wrote for the band. And um, he has a Native American friend that he showed the words to, and they were just practically moved to tears by it. So, so it was, and then they thought we, you know, we really nailed it with the uh, presenting it. And um, our drummer, Jay, also has a, a Native American friend. <clears throat> excuse me and they were they they thought it was incredible and i remember when we premiered the lyric video with the footage um i have a friend that lives in tulsa who's also native american and he messaged me and he, he told us like just how proud he was of us of, of bringing that to light and we thought it was really cool um and it was really kind of bizarre when that was first released. Uh, Metal Injection was the one that uh, premiered that. And there were a few, like, weirdos that were saying, they were saying we were racist and all we cared about was uh, <laughs> the brown-skinned people and all this weird stuff that we just thought, we were just really shocked that people even had those con kinds of thoughts about it. And it just goes to show you that we still have a long way to go with, um, you know, just human relationships and um, other than our own <laughs> and whatever that even means, you know, like it, it was just very, very strange. The reaction, some of the reactions that we got, it was just kind of ran the gamut. And um, I'm trying to think like, okay. Uh, the one of the, li the lyrics mention mention, um, a pale devil or um, something to that effect. And so people thought we were being racist towards white people. And all we were doing <clears throat> was basically presenting the song through the Native American, you know, headspace. And that was their thought process at the time. That That's how they perceived um you know the, the white people and they disarmed the native americans and just massacred them there was no battle <laughs> it was it was a massacre i mean let's not kid ourselves about this and so that's um that was kind of a weird you know we'd never really we don't get political really so so that was kind of odd to um present a historical uh, event <clears throat> and then you know, we're getting called these things and getting accused of certain things that we're not. And that even happened with our song Stalingrad's Cross. We just, it's about the Battle of Stalingrad. But then we had a few people thinking we were like uh, Nazi um, supporters or whatever. And we're like, um, it's just like reading out of a history book, you know? Like we're just basically throwing the what happened out there to, and putting it to a song. <coughs> Pardon me. I guess I should have got a glass of water. So anyway, yeah, I, I really digress there, but but yeah, I hope that question. Wow, I do appreciate that. Now, what kind of push yeah. do you notice it received from being on the Mind Over Metal compilation? That was pretty cool, um, and that one I believe Grave uh, Ghost Dance was on that, <laughs> and. Um, that was something that um, 
I'm trying to think. Cave Dweller Music, I believe, or the Cave Dweller Group was the ones that put that out. And that, that was very important because it brought up mental health and mental health is definitely a subject that um, doesn't get talked about enough, I think. And so it, we just thought, you know, let's bring some awareness to, to that. And um, like myself, I suffer from anxiety and depression and I'm on medication for it. And so it definitely meant a lot to me personally to, to be a part of that. Um, you know, as far as a push, um i mean we we had some people check us out from that to me it was more important to be a part of it and bring awareness to the whole mental health stigma and take that away from the the mental health you know subject and um so yeah that that was basically what that meant for for us was um <clears throat> bringing more attention to you know, people with mental health struggles and, and their plight. And so, yeah, <laughs> that, that's basically what it, what it meant for us though, for sure. <laughs> Your second single was causes. What was the story that you were trying to convey? Mm -hmm. um, on causes, um, <clears throat> that's a song. The lyrics for that are actually, not even no no one in the band wrote those lyrics that was a poem that was written by a friend of ours who had passed away a couple years prior and we had been wanting to do a tribute to him and i believe our bass player mike i think he was the one that suggested because the song was going to be called necro eclosion but we ended up getting permission from his family to use this poem and we we put it in we put it to fit the song and it was weird how the phrasing was just going right along with the music we didn't have to alter or take out any of the words i think there was one line or one phrase that we ended up repeating and then there was one phrase that we did take out but other than that that was the only changes that were made and his name was Ryan Smith, and he was in a lot of different bands here locally in Joplin. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he was always at shows. He was always supporting all the other artists. And the bands that he was in were, I mean, they drew a lot of people. Like, you know, he was a very popular uh, person in the music scene here in Joplin. And, you know, he passed away, gosh been quite a few years ago now i mean he was like he was like late 30s early 40s so <clears throat> pardon me and so it was it was just a really really sad experience and <clears throat> you know it meant a lot to us to be able to pay tribute to him and causes is what the name of his poem was and so we just stuck with that for the song title and that I guess the subject matter, I guess we should have got into that, huh? Um, I mean, ultimately, Ryan is the only one who knows what the song means. But it's de definitely um, a, sh a mental health struggle. Just reading the lyrics, like, you know, I, I have myself and Travis both sing that song when we play live. I sing like a lower vocal and Travis sings a higher vocal. And so it's like a two vocal song. And I know what I'm playing and I'm always thinking about Ryan and I'm always thinking about um, what he went through and, and cause he definitely had his demons with mental health. And so, yeah, it's, it's very emotional every time we play it. And is there, there's mentions of have him having to take medication and there's mentions of attempted suicide in it. And, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a tough one. And, but I got to say that um, I'm, I'm glad we did it and, you know, struggled to, <laughs> to get through it, you know, and it was almost, like I said, it was kind of spooky <laughs> how well 
it fit with the music. And so, yeah, that's definitely a special one for sure. <clears throat> Aldrin was the second man on the moon. What was it about him that you wrote a sight to the sky? Buzz was, um, <clears throat> let me think here. I believe that was another thing our bass player Mike had, he had mentioned it one time about, it's like, man, we ought to write a song about NASA or something, you know? We're all really, Buzz always had this kind of um, badass vibe about him, you know? Like, I don't know, there was just something about him that he kind of just had this cool guy kind of vibe, you know? And we just thought it was, we just thought that the Apollo mission and his life in general was just a cool thing to write. And that song actually features a uh, Voivod's guitar player, Dan Mongrain. Um, he goes by Chewy in his band, but um, he played the solo on it. And <clears throat> we couldn't think of any more appropriate, you know, person for it because Voivod stuff's pretty spacey sounding. So, and he just, he really plays a cool part in it. And, and it really sounds, like it's from outer space, you know, it's a, it fit perfect. Um, I mean, the song's intense and it, it keeps building and we just wanted it to kind of follow Buzz's life because if you think about what he's been through and what all he's done, you know, flying through the, um, what was it? He was in the Gemini program and then the Apollo program. And then he was in the military and, you know, he's, he's shooting down Russian fighters and stuff like that in the, in the Second World War, I believe. And, I mean, you'd have to be a pretty ballsy dude to, uh, to handle all these things, be, you know, going in a rocket, going to the moon, you know, that, that's just amazing. And, you know, we just, <clears throat> we just thought it was an interesting subject and, an, and it had an intensity to it, like our music. And um, we just want our music to be interesting and intense as well. So it was just a perfect fit. And we used samples from NASA's website before and after on the song. And, you know, we tried to be as, like, accurate as possible with it. And so, yeah, it's basically, we just thought it was cool. <laughs> you know, we were, all, we we're all fascinated with NASA. And, we just, and Buzz just happens to be one of our more favorite astronauts. When you were younger, did you get to see any legendary wrestling matches with Andre the Giant? And tell me how it was like writing smaller than death. Yeah, that, that's another um, our bass player Mike suggestion. Um, <clears throat> we had actually watched the HBO documentary about Andre the Giant. That's kind of what kickstarted the whole smaller than death vibe. Um, I never did get to go to any wrestling matches um, myself. I don't know if the other guys did or not, but um, Andre to us was like the first like rock star wrestler. That makes sense. You know, wrestling didn't really have any superstar kind of characters until Andre, at least that's how we feel. And, um, and Andre just kind of, he was just one of those guys who was big, like literally larger than life people. And then that's why we call it smaller than death because you're never smaller than death. You know, death's always going to win. And that was the only thing that defeated Andre was death. And so that, that's basically what the title boils down to. But, but lyrically it was, it was pretty much about his life and there's, you know, the wrestling too, but I mean, it dealt with some of his uh, frustrations with being such a large person and dealing with uh, just trying to live everyday life and having to have stuff custom made for you and not being able to use hotel bathrooms and stuff like that, you know, like, cause he was just such a large guy. He had a hard time dealing with regular life, if that makes sense, you know, and he was renowned for uh, drinking alcohol, but he would have to drink hundreds of, beers to get drunk and um which is kind of crazy but but yeah he was definitely a character definitely an interesting guy and um from that documentary on hbo that was just an eye-opener and you know you don't realize what people go through until you 
either hear about it or see it on something like that. And um, I mean, we just got to thinking, wow, that would be just such a struggle to, you know, like even Shaquille O'Neal, he has to have special cars made for him and stuff like that. And because he just can't fit in a, in a, in the normal vehicle. And Andre was kind of the same way. Like there's just a lot of things he couldn't do because he was just such a large person and the world's just not really built for people that large. And so that, that, that was a big part of it. So. Now for Mad Wolf, that's based on the 1970s Mm -hmm. manga Lone Wolf and Cub about a Ronin samurai and his son. What was Mm -hmm. it about that story that intrigued you and how much of the Sengoku Jidai AKA the Warring States period. Have you followed? Um, I wish our bass player Mike was part of this because, like, this is more his realm, and um, he was—he's like the big Lone Wolf and Cub fan. And um, I've I've seen a couple of the movies, um, and that's more what I'm familiar with, and that's a little bit more what we base the song around. And the second part of the question, I honestly just I don't have an answer for you because I, I'm just not as familiar with it. But um, but yeah, Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, we just again, another just interesting story. And um, the mon- you know, manga and, and, and uh, <clears throat> anime and, and things of that nature, like, you know, the old Godzilla movies, like those are just things that um who's the director um gosh i can't think but um akira you know he 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 had some he he was way ahead of his time and in, and in, in his special effects and like there's scenes that are part of some of those older movies that like american cinema just they just they didn't know how to achieve some of the things that akira kurosawa was doing and so that was kind of one of the more intriguing things about, you know, the, the Lone Wolf and Cub series was um, it was just really ahead of its time as far as the cinematic uh, quality of, of the movies and like the soundtracks and everything were just really dark and sinister sounding and um, it just stuff like that wasn't prevalent with um, American cinema and, and Japanese cinema just had this whole otherworldly vibe to it and and they just they kind of beat us to the punch on that you know i'm uh so i keep saying um don't really want to compare but just what american audiences are exposed to as far as hollywood and things like that it just was a completely different world <clears throat> and you can kind of get lost in the fantasy of it but there was this kind of realness to it as well like it was that always made it to where it was something that it was not beyond the realms of reality. So I think that's what was intriguing about Lone Wolf and Cub was that it was relatable in a way where you can feel like it's not too sci-fi or too out there. Um, you can still ha- have the same amount of feeling invested in, in what they went through, you know, and uh, Ito Ogami, like what he goes through with his, his cub, you know, to um survive you know they had all these (laughs) soldiers and stuff coming after him he never knew you know and i mean if i'm not mistaken his um the actor that plays him has the most on-screen kills in in cinema history like 163 or eight or something like that and i mean that's hardcore you know so so again it's another one of those badass characters that we just relate to and it was just ahead of its time and intense and emotional. And, you know, that's, that, I guess that's just what we were drawn to. You have any concerts coming up that you want to plug? Yeah, we've got, um, <clears throat> we've actually got one coming up this weekend. Uh, it's, it's more of a local show. Um, I don't know when this is going to air, but um it's going to be us, a, ba- a band from St. Louis called Malice Dextra. Um, our drummer, Luke, who's helping us out. His band, Eye Creatures, is playing with us. And then a band called Suit Man. Um, it's going to be Friday, April 1st. That'll be our next one. Then we're going to play April 8th in Ottawa, Kansas, with our buddies in Coventry Sacrifice. And then we've got a whole run of shows of Colorado coming up in May. Um, 
Memorial Day weekend. We got like four shows: Amarillo, Texas, and then Pueblo, Colorado Springs, and Denver. Uh, some of the bigger ones we got. Uh, we're playing the New Jersey Metal Fest on July 9th, and we're playing with Attacker and a bunch of other awesome bands. Uh, um, a couple weeks after that, we're playing New Orleans at uh, Creepy Fest. Um, gosh, we've got all we got all kinds of stuff coming up. I think a day was first maybe it's Labor Day first weekend in September. We're playing a two day fest. Um, we're also playing the Dime Stock Fest. That's in Wisconsin, I believe. But uh, yeah, we got a lot of stuff rolling around this year. So so yeah, it's it's going to be a fun one. Now, what are your three most cherished? historical objects hmm. mm-hmm. historical objects three most cherished historical objects um gosh that's a tough one um i just i that's kind of a hard one to answer i don't know what all i have at this point um we were in a pretty bad tornado and um uh, may of 2011 and we lost a lot of stuff um so i honestly don't know what all i have at the moment um i don't know my wife's here what can you can you think of any historical objects we have no i like us personally mm-hmm. what about that that uh, when we, after the tornado we were digging through the Oh yeah, yeah. We that's right. That there we go. So after we had we were in the tornado, you know everything, and we we lost a lot of stuff. We lost, you know, it demolished our house, and we had a <clears throat> we had a detached garage, and we were digging through the mess, and there was this. I don't know if it was a mortar shell or something like that that was underneath some stuff. We've been living in this house for like 10 years and never knew this was out there. <laughs> and um, we just happened to find it. And then we ended up having to call law enforcement to have them make sure it wasn't a live round or anything. And But I believe, yeah, I can't, I don't know if it was determined what, you know, where it was from or what era, um, but we ended up, uh, can't remember if we kept it or I mean, we may have turned it into law enforcement that that was kind of uh yeah i think the law enforcement took it and um i think they you know disarmed it or whatever uh they seemed to think maybe it was like a dead round or whatever but, but yeah that was that was definitely interesting uh sorry i don't have anything real interesting for this question but um i don't know i, I have like stuff from my great grandma's from the 20s like Mm -hmm. um her sister was a telegraph like she went to telegraph school so do you have an old telegraph from the 20s i have like um uh her kind of her school memory book okay from the 20s pictures and like photographs from the 20s yeah yeah oh um my grandpa's trumpet Oh yeah. yeah my grandpa he passed away about Ten years ago and um, we were cleaning out my grandparents attic and they found his trumpet well we found the serial number on it it's from 1898 and um, we couldn't it's like the size of it was kind of strange it was it was from some chicago music company if i can't remember the, the name and we took it to a local music store to get it replated and they said well we don't think we can do it without damaging it so it's just a wall hanger but um you can kind of play a little bit on it and my oldest son actually plays a few notes on one of our songs with this actual trumpet um it's the song no boundaries no borders which is a final bonus track from your fault and it almost sounds like a train horn it's kind of cool we did two passes of it with two different notes and Anyway, yeah, there, there's that. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I got for you. <laughs> Favorite urban legend or ghost story from Missouri? Well, I would have to say 
the spook light. And the spook light is, it's about, about five miles down the road. It's uh, actually the road we live on. You pull out of my driveway, take a right. You go about five miles down that road and you take a right on, I can't remember the name of this, the road. It's like a highway J or something. <clears throat> and then you park your car and you just sit there wait for it to get dark and then the spook light just comes up and starts moving around and i've seen it and it scared the shit out of me one time and we left because it was getting a little too close <laughs> but it's never been explained they, they say it's the headlights they say it's swamp gas ball lightning it's been all kinds of different but the army the core army corps of engineers the government was basically out here to try to figure it out and they couldn't figure it out there used to be a little museum there. It's not there anymore, but um, they've paved the road, but you can still see it sometimes. But I haven't been out there in, gosh, probably 20 years or so. But, um, but yeah, I've seen it a couple times, and um, it, it's, it exists. It's real. And, I mean, you Google spook light, and it's going to come up. It's called the Hornet spook light or the Joplin spook light, even though it's technically in Oklahoma. It's kind of weird. We're really close to like three other states. Uh, Kansas is just about five miles behind me here. Oklahoma is about six or seven miles south. And then Arkansas is about a 40 minutes south. So, yeah, we're like right in this prime real estate of being right next to a bunch of different states. But, yeah, the spook light is awesome. Definitely cool. Now, where can fans track down your new album? Echo Eclosion can be found on Bandcamp. It's gravehuffer.bandcamp.com. Um, Black Doomba Records also has a few copies. I think we've only got like four copies left uh, out of 300. Um, it actually has sold really well. Um, a little bird told me we might, that the label might be doing a repress. But yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, so yeah, there might be a repress of that, but um, you know, the label's talking about it. And so we'll see. But um, but anyway, yeah, great grayfuffer.bandcamp.com is the best place to find the vinyl. Um, if you just want to check it out digitally, um, you can look at on Spotify, the the Bandcamp um, that I mentioned, iTunes, Amazon Music, Apple Music, you know, all the major streaming sites has it have it. And um, you, know, you can even stream it on YouTube or you know whatever your preferred method is. Our Bandcamp also has CDs if you listen to CDs still. And um, yeah, yeah, it's pretty much available anywhere. And I believe um, if there's any international fans watching, um, PlasticHead.com also has it for the UK and Europe and those areas. Final words. Well, I want to thank you for having me, number one. Um, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, you ask really cool questions, and um, I, I really dig getting to talk about different things other than when did the band form and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, nothing wrong with that, but, but um, it's always nice getting, you know, you're pulling out these really cool things to talk about. So, um yeah, just we hope to see people at some at some shows this year, and um, we're working on our follow up release right now. We actually did some vocal tracks today. Um, it's no secret that the one of the songs is a twenty plus minute song about Dante's Divine Comedy. Um, it's you know the three part Inferno, Purgatory, Paradise. You know it's a three part song. Um, this is definitely not Grave Huffer's new direction. It was just kind of something we wanted to get out of our system. We've been talking about doing our Rush 2112 for a long time now. And then the other side of the album, so to speak, is what Grave Huffer does best. And we feel like this collection of songs is the best we've done. You know, I know it's cliche for bands to say that, but I feel like if you're in a band that believe in what you do, you should say that with every new release. But um, so yeah, that's that's the, the plan for right now is record finish this record and um you know 
play shows. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You've definitely been one of the most historical um, musicians I've ever talked to. So I really oh, nice. appreciate it. Um, That's awesome. This has been an interview with Grave Huffer on Sunday, March 27th, 2022 by Nick Brickham.